Hi, welcome back to some more anatomy. Right, last week we were looking at the carpal tunnel and the flexor retinaculum and the median nerve and things like that. So I, I can't move on without adding on to that Guillaume's canal, also known as the ulnar canal, which might give you a clue. It's very nearby. Um, it, it's less likely to you know, cause problems, but we should recap very, very briefly the carpal tunnel anatomy, add on Guillaume's canal, think about what goes through it, what do those things that go through it do, so if we get compression in there again because we're in a restricted space, what signs and symptoms might we see? Guillaume's canal. I bet there are I bet there are several variations on that pronunciation, mine being one of them. Okay, so last week we said that the bones of the wrist, the carpal bones, form a bit of a curve and the flexor retinaculum goes over the top of those lumpy bony bits to form a canal, uh, to form a tunnel, a carpal tunnel, through there run the tendons of the forearm to move the fingers and also the median nerve. This was the, the flexor retinaculum is a tough ligament, a tough connective tissue tying everything down. So none of this is stretchy. So any inflammation in here, any sort of swelling compresses the median nerve and gives median nerve in the hand signs and symptoms. Um, the flexor retinaculum is also known as the transverse carpal ligament. Okay, that's a recap from last week. Moving on. When we looked at this, we also looked at the bony bits, and today we're interested in the little finger side. And on the little finger side, we have two lumps. We have the peasy form, it's P-shaped, shaped like a P, like a green P, right? And then we have the hook of the hamate. Um, and those two are involved in Guillaume's canal. So if this bit of yellow tape is the, uh, you know, right, right. Um, I'm using yellow tape on a plastic skeleton that's stuck together with bits of wire. This isn't entirely accurate. This is getting the concept across, right? Um, but the, the flexor retinaculum, the transverse carpal ligament, which is its other name, is gonna form the floor of Guillaume's canal. Now in the forearm, like in many regions of the body, there is, um, there's a layer of fascia. So there's a, a, a fascia covering the muscles of the forearm, holding all this stuff together. Now, at the wrist, it thickens in one place to form the palmar carpal ligament. It might be called the superficial palmar carpal ligament because it's on the palmar side. It might be called the volar um, carpal ligament. Carpal because it's at the wrist. So these are the, the bones of the wrist, remember, the carpus, the carpal bones. So the palmar carpal ligament really, as far as I understand it and I've read, it's, it's continuous with the antebrachial fascia, the fascia of the forearm, and it's a thickening of it. It's separate to the flexor retinaculum. It's different to the flexor retinaculum. It's a little bit more proximal than the flexor retinaculum, so it's a different structure. So what we have is we have the, the flexor retinaculum, and then we have another thickening, another ligament, the palmar carpal ligament that's a little bit more superficial to it. You're still with me? So I'm going to put that on here and I'm going to accentuate it kind of like that. Ideally, we need to be able to see the hook of the hame and the pisiform, and we can't really. But that is kind of Guillaume's canal, or the ulna canal, or Guillaume's tunnel, or the ulna tunnel. That there, right? So that means that if I've made Guillaume's canal here, the floor of Guillaume's canal is the flexor retinaculum, that connective tissue that's tying down all the tendons. Um, Towards the little finger side, the medial side, the ulna side, is 
bounded by the pezy form, that P-shaped carpal bone. And then laterally, towards the thumb side or the radial side, we have the hook of the hamate. And the roof of the canal is formed by the palmar carpal ligament. So what goes through it? Well, we have um, a nerve. Guess which nerve? We have an artery. Guess which artery? And we have a vein. Guess which vein? So we have made a canal that's about four centimeters long, is separate, for the car separate from the carpal tunnel, and is carrying ulnar structures. Right, there's another way of looking at this. This is a model that shows what I'm talking about. Um, it's the ulnar nerve, the ulnar artery. What we can't see on here are the ulnar vein or veins. Those are the structures that pass through Guillaume's canal. So that there is the flexor retinaculum with the median nerve deep to it and the tendons running to the fingers deep to it. So what we're missing then is kind of that bit of tape there. That is the superficial palmar carpal ligament. That has been removed from this model so we can see the vessels, but that is lying superficial to, it's lying over the ulnar artery and the ulnar nerve and the ulnar vein and forming Guillaume's canal. Now, as, as these structures pass through Guillaume's canal, if you look at the nerve, the nerve actually divides into superficial and deep branches. So within the canal, it separates. So there's a little bit more to the canal uh, than I've described. But this is the simplest way of thinking about it. Also, we've got muscles of the little finger. So these muscles out here are known as the muscles of the hypothenar eminence. So these guys are also involved in forming some of the boundaries of Guillaume's canal. But the simplest way of thinking about it is that the flexor retinaculum is the floor, as you can see there. The PZ form is out here. The hook of the hamate is in there. And the palmar carpal ligament, that thickening of the distal end of the fascia of the forearm is covering over the lot and forming the roof of Guillaume's canal. That is Guillaume's canal, so it's in the wrist. Next question, why is this information useful to us? Well, the nerve innervates most of the intrinsic muscles in the hand, generally, generally not the muscles of the thumb, that's mostly the job of the median nerve, but the ulnar nerve will innervate most of the muscles of the hand, so giving you abduction of the fingers, adduction of the fingers, but it all does innervate this muscle here, which adducts the thumb. Um, and also it innervates the muscles of the hypothenar eminence, these little muscles that move the little finger around. So, as the nerve and the artery are moving through this enclosed space, if there's anything in there that causes compression of the nerve, you know, something increases in size through swelling. This could be through trauma. It could be through a ganglion cyst, which is a, a swelling of the synovial structures in the joint here. Um, any sort of swelling could compress the ulnar nerve as it runs through the Guillon, Guillon's canal because there's nowhere for it, that compression, that, that swelling to get out to, right? Uh, and that would then cause a number of signs and symptoms. The ulnar nerve is also sensory from the skin of the little finger and this side of the ring finger. And you know this, if you've banged your funny bone, what you've banged there is your ulnar nerve. If you've banged it hard enough, you'll have felt the tingles running up to your little finger. So if the nerve is compressed, you might find a change in sensation of the skin from the little finger and the ring part of the ring finger, maybe pain, maybe pins and needles, uh, some sort of change in sensation, paresthesia. And you may also see a change in, in motor function, in the strength of the small muscles of the hand. So, um, well, anatomically we might say, 
which might cause a change in the strength of abduction and adduction of the fingers, in reality, this changes the quality and the strength of, of grip and fine precision movements because we're using the intrinsic muscles in the hand for the fine movements of our fingers. And you'd also maybe find weakness of adduction of the thumb because it innervates that one adductor pollicis muscle. Um, you might find sensory signs alone, motor signs alone. You might find sensory and motor signs combined. And depending upon where the swelling is, because the ulnar nerve is dividing as it runs through Guillaume's canal, you'll get different symptoms depending upon whether the compression is early or late, right? From a personal perspective, um, as, a, as a cyclist, I used to do lots of miles on the bike. If you're on the tops of the, of the bars, then that's, because you can palpate your pisiform bone there, right? So the ulnar nerve is nearby. You can palpate the pisiform, it's the lump, uh, lump out here. And if you move in, oh, you start to get some unpleasant sensations, like you're compressing the nerve or something. So a cyclist, um, with the hands on the tops, hands on the handle, handlebars for a long period of time can actually compress the ulnar nerve and get those Guillaume's Canal Syndrome symptoms. Um, usually fixed by just changing your position on the bike and holding it in a different way or stopping cycling. That's why cyclists wear gloves and there's lots of padding over that side. Um, but there you go, Guillaume's Canal. If it comes up in polite or impolite conversation, if somebody says Guillaume's Canal, if a surgeon mentions this to you, your brain will tick, 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 whirr, and then eventually bring to the forefront. Oh yeah, that's the canal in the wrist that the ulnar nerve runs through, and it's a separate thing to the carpal tunnel. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, see you next week.